Okay, our second speaker of today's session is Caroline Penke. Caroline is working at the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics of Complex Technical Systems in Magdeburg. She's currently in the final year of her PhD under supervision of Peter Benner, and she's mainly working in algorithm development in numerical linear algebra with a focus on high performance computing. And today she will present her work on stable computation of generalized polar decompositions. Caroline, the stage is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, also, thank you to the organizers for making this possible and for once maximizing communication in the Merkel linear algebra, which we are all in desperate need for right now, I believe. So I want to talk about generalized polar decompositions and how we can compute them in a stable, accurate fashion. So let's start with some motivation. So what we aim to do long-term is called ab initio spectroscopy. So this means that you have the physical structure of a material and you want to compute its optical properties such as the optical absorption spectra. And you want to do this without actually having the physical material in your lab. You don't want to do any experiments, you just want to do computations. And the problems that arise here are usually very large and they need efficient high performance algorithms to be solved. If you can compute these optical properties, you can use this information or well, material scientists can use this information to design new materials that have favorable properties, which can be used in all kinds of applications in the future. So if the arising problems can be solved efficiently, this gives you very valuable information about the material. So we are in particular interested in structured eigenvalue problems that arise in this context. So um, one way to arrive at structured eigenvalue problems is via the beta salpeter equation. Um, this is an equation that describes what is called the polarizability propagator for a wavelength omega. And it approximates it in uh, this fashion here. The matrix H comes from the material or the physical system you're looking at, and it is symmetric and typically positive definite. And what is inside these brackets here um, is known to people from numerical linear algebra as a matrix pencil. And it is invertible if omega is not an eigenvalue of this matrix pencil. So we can also look at the standard eigenvalue problem of what we call now curly H. Um, and the eigenvalues of this eigenvalue problem in the physical sense give you the excitation energies of the material you're looking at. And not only the eigenvalues are interesting, but also the eigenvectors, because they allow you to reconstruct this polarizability propagator and also compute other properties that are interesting. Um, so what does H actually look like? Um, so depending on the kind of basic fu basis functions you use for discretization of operators, um, you arrive at similar looking but different matrices. Um, so a matrix always ends up having a two by two block structure with matrix, uh, with matrix blocks A and B, um, which also show other kinds of symmetry. Um, if you are looking at molecules, you can choose um, your basis functions such that the matrix becomes real in fact. And for solid materials, you usually, you usually end up with a complex matrix and the A block, it might be um, complex symmetric or it might be complex Hermitian. So for all of these matrices, our proposed method works. And um, so in, in this method, the generalized polar decomposition plays a key part. So I will explain exactly what it is in a minute. So if we have one of these matrices, we observe the following facts. So all of the eigenvalues of the matrix H are real and come in pairs of plus lambda and minus lambda. We can also show that the generalized polar decomposition for these kinds of matrices is guaranteed to exist, which is not a clear a priori. And if we compute this generalized polar decomposition and we can use it and uh, we can add the identity and do something like a QR decomposition, a hyperbolic QR decomposition to be specific. And then we can uh, use this computed matrix 
to map the large eigenvalue problem to one that is half the size and an eigenvalue problem that is Hermitian positive definite. And this can now be tackled with all kinds of available algorithms or implementations, even in a high performance setting. So I didn't go into the details here, but the main message is we can use generalized polar decompositions to reduce these structured eigenvalue problems to Hermitian eigenvalue problems of half the size. Okay, let's now start with some basics. What is the standard non-generalized polar decomposition? Um, a matrix can be decomposed in this form. So U is orthogonal and H is a positive semi-definite. So the polar decomposition is a very well-known tool in numerical linear algebra. We've also heard about it before in previous talks in the seminar series. Um, and a good way to compute it is, for example, the dynamically weighted Halley iteration. So there are many iterations for computing this polar factor U, um, but this one has some nice properties. So we start by normalizing A, and then we can do an iteration in this form. We have these uh, scalar parameters A, B, and C, and they can be computed from scalar equations. We start with the lower bound on the singular values of x0, and then we can get these A, B, C parameters basically for free. And the nice thing about this iteration is that it guarantees that the convergence happens in just six steps. Um, okay, we want to generalize this to a setting um, where, similar to what Philip has presented, we look at non-standard uh, inner products. Okay, but first let's look at the standard case. Um, how is it actually implemented? This iteration can be rewritten in this way. And here we see that the main computational effort for each iteration step is solving a symmetric positive definite linear system. This can be done in a straightforward way using a Koleski factorization. It can also be done mathematically equivalent using a QR decomposition. Um, so the advantage of using this QR decomposition is that it is actually stable, but the Koleski-based iteration um, takes less effort. Um, so now for the generalization, um, we are looking at non-standard inner products. So this is exactly what Philip already talked about. So um, I can refer to his talk. Um, we look at... Uh, generalized inner products with respect to a non-singular matrix N. The, uh, scalar, uh, the inner product is defined like this. And we are looking at the adjoint with this, which is uniquely defined by this relation. And it can also be computed um, as a similarity transform of the regular transposed. So the adjoint is the generalization of the transposed. And we call a matrix self-adjoint um, when it's the same as its adjoint, and we call a matrix an automorphism if its adjoint is the same as its inverse. So now, finally, this is the generalized polar decomposition. Um, so a matrix might be decomposed into a matrix W, which is an automorphism with respect to this inner product, and a matrix S, which is self-adjoint with respect to this inner product and has eigenvalues whose real part is larger than zero. So it doesn't always exist. In contrast to the standard polar decomposition, it exists uh, if and only if these two uh, conditions hold. And these generalized, generalized polar decompositions can also be computed via all kinds of iterations. So we can just use the iteration we've seen before, the dynamically weighted Halley iteration, and apply it for the standard case. So now we have a little star here instead of the transpose, and we end up with an iteration. So now we will look at a more specific case, which is uh, the generalized polar decomposition with respect to signature matrices. A signature matrix is a diagonal matrix whose diagonal entries only consist of ones and minus ones. 
And these matrices have the property that they are their own inverse. So we can write down this generalized DWH iteration in this form. And again, we can rewrite this, this iteration such that we see that now instead of, uh, uh, we, we have, again, we have to solve a linear system, but now the system cannot be guaranteed to be positive definite, it is indefinite. So we cannot do a Koleski factorization, but instead we can do an LDLT decomposition. So an LDLT factorization is just the LU factorization applied to symmetric matrices. Um, you can decompose a matrix A um, under certain conditions into a unit lower triangular matrix L, a diagonal matrix D, and L transposed. So if you can do that, you can use it to rewrite the iteration, and then your iteration will look like this. But in fact, this is not the LDLT factorization that is used in practice or which is implemented in MATLAB, for example. In MATLAB, what you get when you use the LDLD command, it's the block LDLT factorization. So this looks similar, but now we have a permutation on the left and on the right side, and D is allowed to have two by two blocks or the diagonal. So this way we don't need any conditions on A and it becomes more stable to compute. Okay, so if you use this decomposition to rewrite the iteration, you end up with this iteration. Okay, does this help? So let's look at a first numerical example. So if you naively implement this iteration and use the backslash operator in MATLAB, then we can see that for badly conditioned matrices, the accuracy becomes uh, really bad. So if you use the uh, LDLT based iteration, which already is aware of the structure, then we already get much better results. So I cannot really explain why it starts to, the accuracy becomes better again for badly conditioned matrices. If you have any idea, let me know. Um, but we are not happy with this yet. So can we devise an iteration um, that gives us better results? So in the original, we had this QR trick. We, manage to avoid the inversion and use the QR decomposition instead. And here in this general setting, we also have a theorem that allows us to do this. So our theorem tells us if we stack X and the identity on top of each other, and we have a decomposition of this form, then we can rewrite this crucial part of the iteration here with the inverse in this form. Okay but now we still have an inverse here. Did we gain anything from this? Yes, we gain something from this if we choose V to be a certain kind of orthogonal. So if N is yet another matrix and V is M to N orthogonal, M2 is just the two M's here, then we can rewrite this such that the inverse is lost. So if N is easy to invert, then this is a good way to go. And actually there is a decomposition that fulfills exactly the needs we have here. It's called the hyperbolic QR decomposition. And it is, uh, can be computed just like the QR decomposition by successive elimination of the sub diagonal entries of the matrix. Um, it gives you an H which is orthogonal with respect to sigma. So this was our signature matrix that defined the inner product we're interested in. Um, and sigma hat, which is another signature matrix. So if we plug in this H into the theorem we've seen before, and we use the theorem to rewrite the iteration, we end up with an iteration that looks like this. So this would be the analog to the QR based the WH iteration. Okay, so we're very hopeful. Does this help? We don't have an inverse anymore, but actually it doesn't really help. So computing the hyperbolic QR decomposition in this way is actually um, not a very good idea. Um, it doesn't have the same stability properties as computing the orthogonal uh, QR decomposition. So uh, in this case, better stick with the LDLT decomposition. 
but our story is not finished yet. So we still hope to get better results. So to get there, I have to lay out some connections between QR-like decomposition and cholesterol-like factorizations. So this is probably something many of you are familiar with. The QR decomposition of a matrix uh, is related to a cholesterol factorization. If you have the QR decomposition of A, then R will also be the cholesterol factor of A transpose A. So it's even possible to compute the orthogonal factor Q by doing a Kolesky factorization and then applying the inverse of R to A. This is usually not done because it's less stable than doing the householder um, standard way of computing the QR decomposition. In the indefinite setting, we have a sim similar analogy. So the hyperbolic QR decomposition is related to the diagonal LDLT decomposition in the same sense. If you have the hyperbolic QR decomposition R, does give you a scaled version of the LDLT factorization. And the other way around, if you have a scaled LDLT factorization, you can use the uh, L or transpose it and call it R, use it to compute a matrix H, which will fulfill this orthogonality property, which we need. Um, so the question arises, which QR-like decomposition is connected to the block LDLT factorization, the one that's actually being used all the time. And um, the answer is given in uh, this work here. Um, and it is they call it the indefinite QR decomposition. It looks quite similar to the hyperbolic QR decomposition, but now we allow, similar to the block LDLT decomposition, um, two by two blocks on the diagonal of R, and we have another permutation. And we have the same similarity, the same connection between the indefinite QR decomposition and the block LDLT decomposition. So we can compute the indefinite QR decomposition via the block LDLT decomposition. Okay, we have already said that usually doing it, uh, doing these computations by starting with a Koleski-like factorization is not a good idea because it's unstable, but if we do it a second time, actually it becomes a good idea. You can, uh, if you do it a second time, it can be shown to be much more stable. And this is actually very helpful in settings where you want to avoid communication, for example, when you want to compute a QR decomposition. Uh, so now we take this idea and apply it to the indefinite QR decomposition. We compute it by, uh, via the LDLT decomposition and we do this twice. And this actually gives us quite good results. Um, if we um, compute the indefinite QR decomposition in the iteration via a double LDLT decomposition, then we achieve um, a good residual, even for very badly conditioned matrices. Okay, can we do even better? Yes, we can, but I'm running out of time. And um, we also had this idea to compute a well um, conditioned basis of the corresponding subspace instead of computing a decomposition and then applying the theorem that we've seen earlier. And um, one can do this by using permuted Lagrangian graph basis. And this basically gives you a perfect accuracy um, in this regard. So let's look at a second example. Um, in our motivation, we have the additional property that the associated symmetric matrix was also positive definite. And in this case, we can show that um, our iteration has the same convergence properties as in the standard case. So we can also guarantee under very mild conditions that our um, iteration, which we called sigma DWH, will converge in just six steps. And in this table, we compared two um, Newton iterations, which are known for showing uh, quite good stability. And the, if we do a determinantal scaling in the Newton iteration, then um, this takes very long for badly conditioned matrices. If we do what is called suboptimal scaling, then we can again guarantee convergence in a limited number of steps. And these are nine steps. 
um, we see that the accuracy achieved by the different methods is comparable or work very well. Um, but our method has the least iteration steps. So um, let me summarize my talk. We were interested in generalizing the QDWH algorithm for computing generalized polar decompositions. Um, this worked quite nicely, but there were some difficulties concerning stability, which we managed to overcome by computing the indefinite QR decomposition via a double LDLT factorization or by using permuted graph bases. And this is useful for structured eigenvalue problems in compu computational quantum science, where these polar decompositions can be used to reduce the number of dimensions I have. So in, we are already working on extending this approach. And if we use Solotaris function, we can guarantee a convergence in just two step. And this can also be extended to formulate a structure preserving spectral uh, divide and conquer method for pseudo symmetric matrices. And thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, this is it. Thanks, Caroline, for this very nice and interesting talk. And uh, do we have questions for Caroline on Zoom, Catherine? We have a lot of questions. I don't know how much time we have, um, but we'll start with uh, Jesse Barlow. Uh, who asks, what would happen if instead of LDL or LDLT, you just ignored the symmetry and used LU? Would your accuracy graph change? Um, yes, so this is um, very important. Um, yeah, so this is basically, yeah, the upper graph. Uh, I guess that's what happens when you do a backslash. You, a backslash. And it, it's not aware that it's like almost symmetric up to um, sign changes. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you basically have, have this. And th also for the Newton iterations, it also becomes much worse when it's not aware of, of the structure of the matrix that we feed into the algorithm. So if you have well-conditioned matrices, everything is fine, but um, if they're badly conditioned, some methods, um, it's always a good idea to take into account the structure that you have. Okay, and we also have a question by uh, Sridhar Chalapa, uh, who says, I didn't fully get it. Do you have the freedom to choose the particular M used in the inner product? If so, does it have some connection to how you model your molecules in the beginning? Uh, yeah, so um, maybe this, this was not good for the teaching point of view. So I, I first, I just introduced a, a very general setting of um, generalized uh, inner products. So um, I, I think mathematical mathematicians like to do this, like start from a very general thing and then take the specific thing you need. So I only need uh, the inner products for where M is a signature matrix. So, um, but yeah, but it's also, they are also uh, at the same time, J normal matrices. And so, yeah, it's nice to have this uh, general theory here available and then use it with whatever you need. Okay, um, there are a few more questions on Zoom, but I, I think perhaps we should, uh, for the sake of time, switch to the YouTube questions. Yeah, let's do that. Davide, do we have any questions there? Okay. So first, another comment uh, by Dave Moore that wants to thank also uh, Caroline for a talk, another beautiful talk, great morning, he says. And we also have a question by Gayatri Taklovich. And did you use pivoting in the JQR decomposition? Um, excuse me, can you, can you repeat the question? Do you use pivoting in the JQR decomposition, he, he asks. Um, I'm not sure, actually. I, I have to look it up. Probably not. Or? <clears throat> I'm not sure. I really cannot say. So if you if you come okay. to the gather sessions, I can I can look it up and then I can tell you. Okay. Any more questions Good. on YouTube? Okay. Then. No, that was the only one. Okay. Thank you. 